liar. Everywhere. On NetRootsRadio.com. David Waldman. Kagra. In the morning. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Thursday, May 6th. 2021. As you know, I guess I'm obligated to say uh, happy Eastern Orthodox Cinco de Mayo to all of you who celebrate and celebrate late because unknown reasons. One day I'll actually look that up, but I assume it has something to do with calendar weirdness. And uh, one day I assume we'll also uh, come under threat from the Eastern Orthodox Church and then we'll stop these things. But I don't know. In the meantime, uh, it's a good natured joke. I think, I hope it's not actually like super <laughs> offensive to people. I don't know. Uh, I'll, I'm happy to give it up, but, but I'm still waiting. I guess I'm not, at this point, I'm, I'm crying out for someone to say something about please stop making that joke. We think we all would like me to stop making that joke. Just not because it's offensive, but because, well, it's offensive to see it over and over again. Maybe that's it. All right. Time to start yet another show. The K-Grow in the Morning Radio Show is live now. We found out, we found this out uh, yesterday, but he's publishing it today, which is Eastern Orthodox Publication Day for Bill's joke from yesterday, which he's using today. I don't know. I'm trying. Anything. Uh, what are we doing? What's on tap today? KGROX promotes the big lie. Oh, we're going to do that. That's good. The big lie that the big lie is a big lie. To cover up the real big lie, eh, I think that's probably about what's going on. Good luck sorting that one out, political, uh, political blah, 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 fact, you know. The fact checkers, uh, they can check my pronunciation of that. It's not hard. We've done it a number of times. But okay, uh, I like the idea of the big lie, that the big lie is a big lie. I cover up the real big lie. There's lots of big lies going on. Uh, news breaking you know, yesterday. So it's all broken, and we have it now. Uh, why were the lunatics, and why are they still the lunatics who are pretending to conduct an audit of Maricopa County's ballots shining uv lights on the ballots and apparently it well there's no real reason i don't know whether this is a real thing or not um i.e uh, there's lots of things that we don't know are real things what they're supposedly doing is looking to see if well looking to see about the composition of the paper used in the ballots why because they have a dumb theory about how the election was stolen. You know, at bottom, that was what they were driving at. The, the, the theory is supposedly that they will be able to detect, to detect bamboo fibers in the paper because the paper, they say, was made in China. Now, why is that a problem? Uh, one... We don't know whether the paper was made in China, for one thing. But uh, if it is made in China, then it certainly will be full of bamboo because China bamboo. I don't know whether that's really a thing or not. The claim is that they make, I don't know, a lot, all, some of their paper out of bamboo because reasons. And it might be true. I mean, you can make paper out of bamboo. Uh, there's the germ of an idea in there that might make some sense. The, the conspiracy theorists, and this may be true in some part, you know, the, there's always some partial truth somewhere in these theories that, uh, they either for reasons of, I don't know, environmentalism or the, they just simply just don't have the, uh, paper forests that we have here. They make them out of, if they make the paper out of bamboo, terrific, great, wonderful. There's nothing illegal, I don't think, about making the paper in China, unless Arizona, and it may be, is one of those states that actually requires that those, you know, that we use made in the USA products, but that doesn't render the ballots invalid or anything. But the theory going here is that the reason that they were, that they're looking for Chinese manufactured ballots is because from somewhere in Asia, they don't want to lay it all on China, 40,000, that's the number they have, 40,000 ballots were imported from outside of the country, marked, you know, maybe they were pre-printed for Biden and stuffed into the ballot boxes. 
So we've heard claims that the UV light was going to help them detect folds in the paper, the claim being that if there were no folds detectable in the paper, then how could they have been mailed in because they don't fit in a regular envelope? And I don't know whether that's true or not, or whether the paper needs to be creased or whether, as Justice points out, bamboo grows in Arizona. It probably does. I mean, people are writing all from all over the place. There's bamboo in my backyard. Did I import the ballots? It, you know, essentially, it's one of those nonsense things that makes just enough sense to a lunatic who doesn't know to look for further evidence. And there's all sorts of other problems. Their procedures there are such that uh, apparently the actual current Secretary of State in Arizona says they've totally destroyed all ability to prove chain of custody in the actual ballots. They've been taking them out of the boxes, moving them around. They don't track them. Nobody watches them. Nobody monitors them. No one tracks the movements of the ballots. So now, even if they were to somehow come up with the idea of... um uh, that th- they had identified 40,000 ballots that had come in from outside, there would be no way of proving that they weren't the ones who brought them in. But of course, they'll say, well, that you know, that's insane. So the whole thing is, you know, designed to fall apart from the beginning. But that's the word. Now, you know, there's all sorts of other questions like, does shining UV light on paper made by bamboo look like anything other than shining UV light on American made paper? I don't know. They haven't said so. They, I mean, they could just say so, but they haven't even just said so. So they don't make the claim. They haven't established anything. Uh, nobody has gotten on camera and said, this is paper made of bamboo and this is paper made from American wood products and look at the difference under UV light and even tried to demonstrate that. At which point you would say, how do I know that's paper made from bamboo or paper made from bamboo in China or anything? How do I know it's anything? How do I know who you are? Why do you know anything about paper and what it looks like under UV light? All questions left unanswered. Uh, Just to round this out, uh, apparently all the workers now also have to sign non-disclosure agreements and nobody's allowed in to look at the process. And though so far they're refusing to describe their process to any judges as well. So it's getting kind of like that South Park episode with the uh, founding of the Mormon church. It's, you know, we've got Joseph Smith looking in a hat and declaring this is the way it is. And the rest of us are sitting there writing down. I don't know. Some kook says it looks funny under UV light. Therefore, something, something. And Trump himself apparently actually believes in all this and is telling the diners at Mar-a-Lago every night. So, you know, we're not done with this kook, I guess, even though Facebook is. Uh, No ban on Greg Dworkin on Facebook. Just he's banned from the first 10 minutes of today's show, I guess. Good morning, Greg. How are you? Good morning. So Hi. we went to an upscale diner in Florida oh, to good. find out upscale. what the pandas thought about this Arizona recount. <laughs> right. Delicious, they said. The diners at uh, Mar-a-Lago think it's a great idea. The pandas uh, could not be uh, reached for comment. Yes, well, there there's a panda pandemic on. No, so. apparently there's a pandemic in, in Arizona. I, I just I still don't understand why this is being allowed to happen. I don't know. Not by I mean, the judge, not by anybody else. It's ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, they really should have. You know, what, what is chain of custody for 400, Alex? Right. I mean, I, I don't know why they let that go ahead. I understand that they, they still think in the courts there that the state Senate is a valid entity. Okay. They want to conduct this well, investigation. Well, that's like thinking okay. the Republican Party is a valid entity. Well, yeah, I guess they're, they, we do I have I mean, Ron DeSantis is having a bill signing in Florida Maybe. where he's only allowing Fox News to watch. The whole thing's ridiculous. Right. <laughs> and he's handing out campaign paraphernalia as well. Instead of armbands, which is what he should be doing. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, uh, sensitive in Florida. So, yeah, they uh, the, many things happening that really should not be happening. I understand they want to do some of these things, but... Why the Secretary of State was unable to block these these nuts from destroying the validity of these ballots? It's all ruined now. You can never find out what's going on. I mean, they and were they worthless. can declare whatever they want. So yeah. if you make them worthless, you could argue, well, I'm not going to spend a million dollars to prove that you took something worthless and made it worthless. Uh, you know, yeah, the, the election's over, so they're worthless now. And, but they got to have a a judge you can depend on to you know dismiss the whole thing in the end. 
Well, they sort of almost did, but then didn't. That's the part I'm totally confused. I Mm. don't understand what their role is at this point, who's suing who, what the ruling is, what they're waiting for, and all that that. nonsense. All all uh, the the non-legal people like me are looking at this and saying, what? What's, you know, Marvin Gaye, what's going on? Yeah, well, right. I mean, can anybody just walk in and say, no, I want the ballots? I mean, I guess so, right? Yeah, well, you're, you're no more of a uh, valid entity than, uh, you know, I guess if you uh, get the Senate. Teenage Senate Ninja uh, uh, jump starting uh, uh, cheaters, you know, or whatever their name is in Florida. <laughs> uh, that's a new one on me. Okay. Texas. Mutant what, what's ninja the name? Of ninja something? I mean, oh, they, cyber ninjas. That's, that's I see. Doing oh, yeah, right. right. Florida? Cyber ninjas. That's cyber uh, ninjas. Arizona. Yeah, same yeah. thing. Sure. Florida, Arizona. <laughs> but yeah. they're from Florida. They, just, oh, they probably uh, are. You know, they happen to go to Arizona and uh, supervise this because they have no expertise. And they, did, they didn't have enough people without expertise in Arizona. They had to import people without expertise from Florida. Mm, yeah. Well, if you're looking for people without expertise, uh, start in Florida. Yeah, listen, you know, go no further than Texas. Why'd you have to go all the way east? I don't know. Uh, maybe they, I don't know. Maybe they hired at Mar-a-Lago. That could be maybe uh, the Mar-a-Lago. We're back to that upscale diner again. So yeah, all oh, right. You know, the whole thing oh, is that's kind of the nuts. Upscale and diner. and and continuing on the kind of nuts thing. Yeah. Okay, we have the big news. Really, has been dominating the uh, political media is uh, Liz Cheney of all things. Okay, which, which I think is worthy of commentary. She had a big op-ed. Sure. In the Washington Post yesterday, yes. where she said, among other things, I think we Republicans need to stand for genuinely conservative principles. History is watching to yes. skip ahead. Our children are watching. We must be brave enough to defend the basic principles that underpin and protect our freedom and our democratic process. I'm committed to doing that no matter what the short term political consequences might be. So she essentially told uh, uh, the uh, feckless, the lacking feck, uh, <laughs> no uh, Kevin McCarthy. given to uh, go stuff it. Yeah. And if you take me out of leadership, you take me out of leadership. But I am not going to participate in the big lie because this is all a big lie. So Mm, she said that loud and clear for everybody to hear. Yes, she's going to lose this battle and get taken out of Republican leadership. She may even get thrown out of the party. But if you're into rule of law and American democracy and patriotism and stuff like that, you know, she's going to lose the uh, battle but win the war. Because, you know, I happen to think American democracy in the end is going to win because we always try everything else first and then we do the right thing. The the wind up uh, to all of this, though, mm, is yes. that she will be thrown out. And as this is happening, uh, Kevin McCarthy, on the other hand, is, according to CNN, quite nervous that uh, he's going to be called by this January 6th commission under oath. And he doesn't want to be under oath because if he's under oath, he has to talk about that phone call he had with Trump or he was, you know, scared and pooping in his pants. Yes. Or he and could then lie. if that happens, then everything he says is exposed as a lie. And that is why the Republicans are blocking, among other reasons, the January 6th commission. The <sighs> bigger thing is they don't want to review that and have everybody know that Trump tried to overthrow the government of the United States. But the shorter term thing is he doesn't want to be implicated in it and he doesn't want to go on oath under oath Mm -hmm. and say that I'm I'm still lying to you. So, uh, you know, you have Liz uh, Cheney on the one hand doing what she's doing and McCarthy doing what he's doing. And that doesn't mean progressives have to put Liz Cheney on a pedestal. She is still who she is. She's Um, still a Cheney clan. There's a lot of things to dislike about her. But in this particular argument. She's telling the truth. And so True. fine, you know, go with the person who's telling the truth. Yes. And if you put her on a pedestal, you can always push her off. Yeah. Well, you know. It's a good reason to put somebody like that throw, on a Throw pedestal. her into Bristol very, Harbor. Very, very I mean, big done, pedestal. Right? So, high pedestal. Okay. Yes. True. Right. Yeah. And hope Roll her down the step. street. Mm-hmm. But, but, but the whole thing is she's right. Mm. And so, and she knows she's right. And she knows she's going to get kicked out anyway. And she's saying, I don't care. I'm just telling okay. you the truth. Yes, I do understand she's given up the fight and she's just not contesting the thing. She's not contesting it. Exactly right. She said, I'm not going along with this nonsense. And not only am I not going along with this nonsense, I'm going to tell the truth and go ahead, throw me out. I dare you. All right. Okay, we will. Okay, fine. But I'm still telling the truth. And once I'm out, then I can say even more stuff. And the weird thing is you have all these Mm. comments from Republicans in Congress, not like average, everyday Republicans who are 
you know, somewhat persuadable, not not the solid uh, core uh, MAGA people, but okay. gener- general Republicans who don't think about politics that much. Um, and the Republicans in Congress are saying, look, I get she believes what she believes, and that's fine. But she's in leadership, and leadership's job is to lie to everybody. Yes. And so she can't stay in leadership because the whole thing is we have to stamp out Democrats. That's the purpose of leadership. Right. Well, well actually, I mean, it's not, say, but so. it is. I mean, it is if you're in Congress because your job is to get reelected and make sure that your uh, party has the majority. If you're a Republican, uh, if you're a Democrat, oh, by the way, we also have to figure out how to uh, somehow slip governance in there. Mm-hmm. Republicans don't have that problem. They don't care about governments. They don't know how. They, they don't know how to do anything. They don't care if they don't do anything. Their only job is to get reelected. Why the public doesn't see that, I don't get. But, you know, there it is. There, there's a whole group of people who somehow see things differently, and it's always nice to figure out why they see what they see. But the truth is hmm. that Republicans don't care about you. They don't care about their voters. They don't care about no. anything else except getting reelected. And why they have to be rewarded for that, I don't know. Um. Yeah. I don't know. I have no real reason for it. I, I say we punish them for it, but no one's listening. Meanwhile, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, Jamie Dupre, is a nice piece here. Only Trump matters in the GOP purge of Cheney. The internal Republican battle over false charges of election fraud made by Donald Trump boiled over again this week. Notice how he frames it properly. Even the mm. Times is calling it a lie. Okay. Like way after, you know, four years late, they finally admit Trump is lying. It's, and it's big. Uh, but, uh, you know, Jamie Dupre didn't have a problem. He's always said that the internal okay. Republican battle over false charges of election fraud made by Donald Trump in 2020 boiled over again this week for the GOP, sparking a likely leadership shakeup for P- Republicans in Congress. Mm-hmm. It almost seemed logical. The latest twist in this fight would bubble up in Georgia as Liz Cheney blasted Trump during a political retreat in Sea Island, first behind closed doors, then very publicly on social media. The 2020 presidential election was not stolen, Cheney said Monday. Anybody who claims it is, is spreading the big lie. That's capital letters all of it. Turning their back on the rule of law and poisoning our democratic system. She is correct. That was too much to stomach for U.S. House Republicans, many of whom already voted this year to overturn election results in Arizona, Pennsylvania, embracing Trump's evidence-free claims of election fraud. Notice Jamie's a framing of all of this. Mm-hmm. Yes. He doesn't he doesn't make it sound like it's both sides. It's not both sides. And in a sense, the effort to get rid of Cheney mirrors the way Republicans turned on Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, who committed the original sin of repeatedly rejecting Trump's allegations of election wrongdoing. Mm-hmm. It didn't matter if Raffensperger and Cheney were both correct. Raffensperger is already facing a primary challenge from Jody Heiss, who fully supported Trump's lies of widespread election fraud. Again, notice his framing. And now it's expected Heiss and other Republicans will vote as soon as next week to boot Cheney from the number three GOP leadership post in the U.S. House, likely replacing her with Elise Stefanik, Stefanik, uh, yeah, whatever Stefanik, uh, Republican New York. <laughs> Ick. It's interesting. Ste- uh, Stefanik is Stefan. not a, a conservative. Um, I, they don't well, care. That's not yeah, the point. See, I mean, the whole point is whether or not you sure are... Not. Uh, fully adherent to Trump's lies, not whether or not you have any ideology right. you somehow support. Again, yes. that's why the whole thing is so nuts to me. Uh, well, it is. There's plenty of uh, nuts to go around. I saw somebody roll out, uh, you know, one of the uh, uh, rankings, essentially, or, or, or the, you know, as they keep track of uh, how often Stefanik versus Cheney actually voted with Trump. When he was when he was president, you remember yeah, when Cheney president? voted with Trump yeah. a lot more than ninety something percent. That, again, that's not the point. Seventy something percent. It's, it's saying black is white and red right. is blue, and because you said so, and I agree, and the sky is green. Uh yeah, and then of course elevating her to conference chair. I mean, she, I think she's been in con- Congress for about fifteen minutes. Stephanie. Yeah, Club for Gruff doesn't like it. They already right. said she's she's not a conservative. They don't, like they don't want her. Yeah. Uh, of course, club for growth doesn't matter. What Trump says no. in the Republican Party does. So CNN Politics reports Arkansas GOP Governor Asa Hutchinson says the fight over Liz Cheney's place in party leadership is a bad look. Reed Galen, sure. former uh, Republican operative, says it's not a bad look. It's a difference between democracy and authoritarianism. January 6th, don't look away. Okay. I mean, and in fact, that's, that's, bad look too. that's why she's on the right side of history. 
even though I'm for no this fan for this. Yeah, right. I mean, uh, look, eventually she was going to land on the right side of history at some point. You just keep tossing that coin. Even that evil, unbalanced, rigged coin is going to come up heads once in a hundred throws. Here it is. Right. Anyway, so uh, uh, moving to something a little more amusing, uh, which is the way the uh, New York Times and other big city newspapers covers things, including the South, since a lot of this is about Georgia. They amuse you. Um, they amuse so you? There's this thing going around where people take blank pages and then fill in the headlines based on their profession. Here's how economists would do hot takes. You know, oh. Here's how uh, doctors would do hot takes. And this particular one is called Types of Parachute Journalism About the South. And you can imagine uh, New York Times headlines. Okay. They're this way, right? What old men in West Virginia diners tell us about America, for example. Okay. A small newspaper reported this three months ago, but now I'm here for the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's my I love show. these because they're just no, so it's not true. funny at all. How this disaster I just learned about could have been avoided. <laughs> we talk, we talk about okay. this all the time with pandemics. Yes. On this blue dot in a sea of red, or we uh, talk to black and Latinx what? voters in a Walmart parking lot. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Low in profile of centrist candidate who actual voters dislike. Uh, that happens, sure. Right? Mm -hmm. The case for not giving the South our tax dollars because they're Republicans. <laughs> Unfortunately, too much talk about it. Yeah. Right. right. We were shocked to discover communities of color in the rural South. Hello. There they are. Okay. okay. This small town is the Brooklyn of Alabama. <laughs> I love that one. <laughs> what? <laughs> and, you know, so uh, the, the Southern uh, folks are having fun with this, as they should. Okay. And it just, uh, it, it's a, a sly and subtle hint about some of the bias you see in headlines and, mm -hmm. and coverage. And so that takes me back to how you're covering Cheney uh, versus uh, uh, the rest of the Republican Party. It's the same way that you do glowing reports of this person looks like they may have a chance to win. Marjorie Taylor Greene is doing great in oh. terms of fundraising. You know, mm. instead of talking about why they're unqualified and why they shouldn't be there in the first place, you reduce everything to, ah, but it just might work, Chuck Todd yeah, style. Right. Well, in some places it does. But, yeah, you, you should warn people. Well, yeah, what does this does, mean when the they point. get there? Yeah. Right. I, I understand that they'll be elected. Is that I, good or bad? I, I know you shut up the place and, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you actually uh, harm some people, but you just might get away with it. I mean, that's a terrible way to frame things. But, you know, there's Carl Rittenhouse. Hmm. Yeah, true. We have that story. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's just it's awful when it happens and you see it happening, you know, uh, call it out. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, that's that's a lot of what's going on today here. This is uh an interesting piece from Axios in that regard. Mm -hmm. Trump's spell over the media broke once he lost his megaphone. And it mm -hmm. tracks daily social media interactions on stories about Trump. Okay. Back yeah. in January, we're talking about 50 million hits a day. Mm -hmm. And now we're down to 1.9. Okay. And the huge difference, the drop, has to do with uh, losing Twitter and Facebook accounts. And by the way, Facebook yesterday uh, playing Supreme Court said we're not letting them back on Facebook, at least for the time being. Right. OK. And Social Flow CEO Jim Anderson, who tracks this stuff, tells Axios Trump's social media superpower was never his ability to tweet. It was his ability to get the media to cover what he tweeted. Mm, OK. And the point is that. When Trump tweets, yelling at media is important because they're doing it wrong. Yeah. Just well, because he tweeted something doesn't mean you have to drop everything and then, you know, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. You made things repeat. worse. Well, he's a president. We have to cover it. Not that way. You don't have to cover it. Cover it the true. way Jamie Dupre covered it. Yeah. Talk about the lies. You don't have to repeat the tweet or retweet the tweet or do anything other than say Trump uh, erroneously claimed X, Y, and Z again. That's all you have to do. Yes. And only now, after he's out of office, are they starting to call it lies. I mean, like in the big papers, oh. like the New York Times. Well, I'm glad they're getting around to it. Yeah, they certainly had more options for ways to cover it. I, I'm sympathetic to the people who – well, I'm sympathetic to the people who have been uh, getting yelled at for you know retweeting Trump tweets back in the day when there were such things as Trump tweets. 
uh, just because, and, and this is where the social media platform was such gold for him, is the easiest thing to do if you wanted to comment on it and say he's lying was to retweet his tweet that you said he was lying about. Although it was nece- not really necessary for you to produce proof that he was lying, but but it was such an easy thing to do. That's how, how, how do you make it so Trump tweets can't be, and politician tweets can't be retweeted, right? You have I to make screenshots know. or write them up yourself. Uh, yeah. Well, you could, I mean, I guess you, you could do anything you want. It's a private want, company. But, Why but, the hell uh, do you have to I don't participate with that sort of crap? Uh, no. But yeah, I, I was, I guess a good thing would be to make it either less easy or easier to do something that, um, uh, or you're, doesn't you're count required to quote him, tweet you know? it. You can't just tweet it. You have to comment on it. Maybe. Right now they're making us read the articles. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're suggesting that you do. They're Thank abs- you for reading the article. I just admonishing want to retweet this thing. It. I don't want to read the damn article. <laughs> well, you don't I wrote to. the damn article. <laughs> that, that's a problem <laughs> for people. You're yeah. making me you know, read the article that I wrote. I already read it, and I'm sick of it. I don't want to read it right. again. Well, I definitely understand that people were saying, you know, you, you're – you know, regular people are giving him this power too by retweeting it, and it's true. And occasionally, I would remember, oh yeah, right, take a screenshot instead of retweeting it. But I don't know if that has any lesser effect or not. He's still well, just don't do it. And so people around. aren't doing it, and now all of a sudden, nobody really cares about what he says well, on his uh, new platform, which is a grift because all it is is a platform that's saying from the desk of Trump, and then at the top it says <laughs> uh, donate here. Right. I mean, okay, it's a blog with a donate button. Um. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he's also us. not president. Well, that also back, cuts people down say, well, you know what? It never left. Hmm. Yeah, right. Oh, that's all he does. So, I don't know. I, I, I find the new platform kind of funny in that it's not a, well, for one thing, it's not a new platform. It's just another place that you tried to do something. Then they, they tried to sign up for an account on Twitter called From the Desk of Trump or yeah, the desk of whatever, Donald that's Trump. Not yeah. no. And they, they actually they went and banned that right away. So that was pretty good. I'm glad they did that and didn't try to let it through on some kind of loophole technicality. More uh, on the pandemic after the break. Yeah, after this loophole. We'll be right back. Hi, it's me, David Goldman, your host for k in the Morning. I have good news to report. Many more listeners like you are making critical contributions that keep our show on the air. Makes good sense, of course, and Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it simple. Now you can make easy, secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. Maybe you'd like to thank us for helping keep you sane during the trip era. Maybe you're looking forward to in-depth explanations of what's going on in the Biden administration. Whatever it is that keeps you listening, we need your help to keep bringing it to you. And hey, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running with those options too. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We literally could not do this without you. All right, welcome back now to the Kid Going in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Time now to bring uh, Greg Dworkin back in from the Midwest Diner. Come on in. All right. We had uh, pandemic news on tap. Hang on. I'm, I'm, I'm finishing something my Something else omelet. happening? Okay. All right. Uh, in the meantime, I'm looking at your picture of page 11. Oh, I don't know if that's page 11. It, oh. Or it says page 11 at the top. Oh, but page I, 11. I, I see what you mean. Turning on Cheney, the GOP bows to Trump's election lies. Mm, uh, that's wow. the headline in the it's print New York on Times. Cheney. Yeah. Okay. I'm glad. Trump's election lies. Trump's election lies should have been what they called it forever. As we yes, like but to they, say wouldn't, in New York they didn't forever. want to out, uh, uh, affect the outcome of the election. You know the New York Times policy. Yeah. So, you know, the New York Times policy sucks because <laughs> they got it wrong. Right. Well, this is going well, on. Both sides. Uh, you have to be fair to both sides. One now. side is trying to steal the election. The other isn't. You've got to be fair to both. Right. It's just a different point of view. You don't want to affect their ability to steal the election. Just cover it. Yeah. Cover Arizona. Why don't you? Hmm. So meanwhile, uh, AP right. is getting a little feisty, too. Republicans promote pandemic relief they voted against. <gasps> is their story today. Where and yes, they find that's that something they could have reported the entire time. Yes. It's less news as archival footage at this point. Right. But exactly. OK. Right. I'm glad they did. So, um you know, there's there's a lot going on here. And again, it's you're not always going to change people's minds, but deplatforming them can be helpful. 
Yes. Uh, here, here's a, 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 an example in, in a different vein. Uh, Rachel right. Weena tweets this, former Atomwaffen leader. Oh, yes. Sentenced to 41 months in prison, apologizes months. for swatting a ProPublica reporter, says he doesn't plan on joining another neo-Nazi group. Okay, no plans. But admits, through his yeah. attorney, that he's still a white supremacist. Darn. Well, and uh, Seamus Hughes notes, what this means is that they're disengaged, not de-radicalized. So oh. these folks are still going to be out there. But if you well, disengage them, that's a yeah. win. I it's guess. not as satisfying as convincing them not to be white supremacists. That may be a bridge sure. too far. Right. But at least get them out of the process. Okay. I mean, prison, that's something. I don't know about well, the 41 what I'm months. Saying, you know, that, that's a more extreme example of deplatforming. Oh. But yeah, the concept that's true. is valid. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, okay. I, I, I mean, there are very few people. I don't know how many people I would say, let's deplatform this person, but not send them to oh, prison. Oh, we say it in a different way. Look, you're someone. not going to convince Trump voters. You just have to outvote them. What does that mean? It means, you know, right. you, you're, you're not trying to change their minds. Right. But if you said prison, I would be okay. Well, you know. I mean, you know, I, it's the process. I can't stand in the way of that. You can appeal if you want, but if you're right. sentenced, you're sentenced. Right. I don't care uh, well, if you're faking. Know, you don't want to be process. hung right. by the neck until you cheer up. Appeal to the vote. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, that's the ultimate it's part authority. of the process. That's we have it right here in our secret process. You're not allowed to see because our process of hanging you until you cheer up was written by <laughs> cyber ninjas. Mm, yeah, right, and, and that's trade secret. To know what the process is. Sorry, only. Only uh, one American news will be allowed to cover it. Right. I have to start my own. Okay. Uh, so, you know, that, that's part of the process months. here. So meanwhile, How long is that? Yeah. Uh, the new poll out from uh, uh, Kaiser Family Foundation tracking vaccine hesitancy and other things is out. The vaccine monitor, they call it for April. Okay. Our new vaccine monitor is out today. One finding a majority of Republicans are now vaccinated or want to be. Oh. And fewer are resistant. It shows slow, inch-by-inch inch progress as possible, even as vaccinations overall has markedly slowed. Again, here's how the New York Times covers it, buried in their article. It says yeah. the survey did show that there had been some progress among Republicans who had been among the firmest holdouts. Among that group, 55% said they had gotten a shot or intended to, up from 46 in March. The percentage will definitely not is shrinking as well, down to 20 mm -hmm. from 29. Oh, okay. well. So I that's some like improvement. It. Of course, the title of the article is Poll Shows Parents Are Reluctant to Get Their Children Vaccinated for COVID-19. Only 9% of adults who hadn't gotten the shot planned to do so, suggesting the country's nearing the limit of people planning to get immunized. That's not what it suggests. Oh. No. Well, what not it suggests the rest of it. is that the last group of people that you have to convince since you already picked the low-hanging fruit, is going to be harder to get. But the number of people who definitely won't is still only 13%. Hmm. So it's not that hard. No. 56% have already gotten, 9% as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. All right? So that's 65% of the public already got covered. Yeah. 15%. Wait and see. But that's down from 31 in January. Well, they've waited. And they've seen Right. And, and so half of them have gotten it and the other half are still waiting and seeing. OK. Hey, uh, yeah. Six percent hmm. are only if required. But very soon, that's kind of the uh, vaccine, uh, at least from Pfizer, hmm. is likely to be off of emergency use, youth, emergency use Youths. authorization, EUA. OK. And on regular. Yes, it's approved. Once that happens, the military can mandate it. Schools can oh, continue to mandate it and make a better case for it. Okay. Okay. So that uh, only if required, well, a lot of you mm. are going to have it required. Okay. Um, I mean, maybe, if all I mean, of those others, if get. half of the uh, wait and see and all of the only if required, because now it's required, get it, we're still down to 20%. You know, so the whole tone of the uh, New York Times is, well, this may not happen. Actually, what it's telling us is that it's going to be more difficult. We knew that. But when you drill down the numbers, it's going to be slow, you right? find even Republicans are coming around. It's just that it's slow. Okay. Slow we can deal with. Slow we can deal with. That's exactly right. And that's where we're at. Jen Cates looks at it from uh, uh, 
She's the global health and HIV policy director at uh, Kaiser Family. With the US FDA expected to authorize Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine for 12 to 15 year olds any day now, our latest vaccine monitor mm-hmm. underscores the importance of parents in the next phase of vaccination. Among parents with kids who are 12 to 15, 30 percent say they'll get their child vaccinated right away. Twenty six percent will wait and see. Eighteen percent only vaccinated school requires it. Pro mm-hmm. tip, a lot of schools are going to require it. And 23 percent won't vaccinate. So the 23 percent who won't vaccinate is not that far off from the 13 uh, percent of adults who won't vaccinate. And the point is your attitudes about your kids is just going to reflect your attitudes about yourself. And if that's the case, that means most of the kids will be vaccinated. And that means it's another pool of people that we're going to get vaccinated. And that's good for the country. Yes. But they can't drive through, not themselves. But that doesn't make for good articles. Right. So, no. you know, you have to say, oh, well, parents are refusing. Well, that's not really what's going on here. Hmm. Well, I had uh, wondered about that. I wondered whether the uh, discussion of saying, all right, well, we've saturated the market with vaccine. People who want to get it have gotten it time to ship it overseas, whether that has made any people who are wait and see or say, oh, I'm, 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 don't uh, <clears throat> don't send all of them just yet. Right. Uh, and then at the same time, uh, people aren't real them. keen on the J&J vaccine, but that's not spilling over to the others. And we have plenty of the others. Yeah. So, right. you know, the, the key to all of this is what the government is doing now, mm. making, uh, you know, pop up vaccines and sending the vaccines to uh, pediatricians and, and to uh, uh, family docs. So you can get it at your doctor the way you normally would get your vaccines, sending it to the pharmacies and having them do no wait or uh, walk in appointments, all of that's happening. So that'll help little by little. Every group is a little bit different. And in looking at that, there's a really nice piece here from Derek Thompson at The Atlantic. Uh, Millions are saying no to the vaccines. What are they thinking? Feelings about the vaccine are intertwined with feelings about the pandemic. So he takes a very interesting approach, which is to say, ask people and then listen to what they say. That is Instead of declare beforehand, I know what you're going to think. Now tell me. So I, I can write it down. To be the usual approach. Yeah, yeah, maybe you're right. Okay. Yeah. So uh, he says, I am a pro vaccine person and I'm coming at this, but I want to know what you're thinking. And I promise to write down fairly what you're saying. I don't believe you. Okay. All right. So many people I spoke with said they trusted their immune system to protect them. Nobody ever looks at it from the perspective of a guy who's what? like me, said Bradley Baca. 39-year-old truck driver in Colorado. As an essential worker, my life wasn't going to change in the pandemic, and I knew I was going to get COVID no matter what. So I think I got the antibodies. I think I got COVID. Why should I take the vaccine? Uh, Okay. In December 2020, I tested positive and experienced many symptoms, said Derek Perrin, a 31-year-old service technician in Connecticut. And Connecticut is one of the best vaccine records in the country. Since I've already survived one recorded bout with this virus, I see no reason to take a vaccine that's only been approved for emergency use. Ah, Mm -hmm. but Derek, what happens after it's approved for more than just emergency use? He's a lawyer, too, this guy. (laughs) All right. But but the point is they're aware of this stuff. I guess so. That guy is pretty pretty clearly aware of, I think, I mean – Right. Others we are worried that the vaccine might have it. long-term effects. As a black American descendant of slavery, I'm bottom cased in terms of finances. The fact what? that there's no way to sue the government if I have any adverse reactions is highly problematic to me. Well, that's where class action suits come in. Yeah. Many people said they had read up on the risk of COVID-19 to people under 50 and felt the pandemic didn't pose a particularly grave threat. Mm, right? It's not like I don't get in my car. Much. car driving's dangerous. I'm going to take the risk. Okay. And others said that the perceived liberal overreach had pushed them to the right. Before March 2020, I was a solid, progressive Democrat. These are the ones I read and I don't know. No, this you're is not. This is from Gen- Jen and Young, a 37 year old attorney, said, I'm so disturbed by the Democrats' failure to recognize the importance of civil liberties, although for anybody who takes a strong stand for civil liberties and doesn't permit the erosion of our fundamental rights that we're seeing now. How do you feel about the Arizona recount? Yeah, right. Good question. Right. Tell or... me that before you answer this. Uh, Bull torture something you know all right right okay. after many conversations and email exchanges i came to understand what i think of as the deep story of the american no and i think the best way to see it clearly is to contrast it with my own story and he uh, talks about the fact that he was concerned about he really the pandemic and he wanted to protect his grandmother the under 50 no deep story is a very different starting place he says it begins like this 
The coronavirus is a wildly overrated threat. We talked about this. If you're in a rural area, you feel very different about it than you do if you're in New York City Mm -hmm. watching the hospitals get overrun and hearing the people cheer every night at five o'clock. That's not your experience in a small town. Right. The coronavirus is a wildly overrated threat. It's appropriate and good to protect old and vulnerable people, but I'm not old and vulnerable. If I get it, I'll be fine. In fact, maybe I have gotten it and maybe I am fine. Um, I don't know why I should consider this disease more dangerous than driving a car. A risky thing I do every day without a moment's worry. Remember, this is an amalgamum of what people mm-hmm. are saying. Right. Liberals, Democrats, and public health elites have been so wrong, we'd better off doing the opposite of almost everything they say. Take out your seatbelt then. Right? And I don't need some novel pharmaceutical product to give me permission to do the things I'm already doing, which is go about my job because I'm an essential worker and I couldn't stop working anyway. Those are the people in South Texas. It yeah. felt like uh, trying to shut things down for the pandemic was wrong because they need to put food on the table. Mm-hmm. This isn't even an FDA approved vaccine. It's authorized for an emergency. And I don't consider COVID-19 a personal emergency. So I'm not going to get the vaccine. I have no reaction to that. Right. He says, uh, the author, Derek Thompson, although I think I'm right about the vaccine, the truth is my thinking on this issue is motivated. I canceled vacations, canceled my wedding, avoided indoor dining. All that sucked. I'm rooting for the vaccine to work, but the no-vaxxers I spoke with just don't care. They've traveled. They've eaten in restaurants. They've gathered with friends. They went to Sturgis. He didn't say that. I'm throwing that in. Mm -hmm. They survived. They decided it wasn't a big deal. Right. Everybody else died, though. Exactly. Not their problem. So what will change their minds, he says? Number one, try something like DoorDash for vaccines. Oh. Make it easy. Make it, uh, you know, glitzy. They should. Uh Critics, uh, cities should start to roll out a vaccine in-home service, which people can book on short notice. Providers come to you and bring you some sort of gift. You know, maybe they bring you lunch. <laughs> a donut. We were criticized Whatever. for that. Whatever. That works. A Krispy Kreme and a vaccine, but they come to your house and you don't even have to travel. Yeah. Cities ought to be able to do this. So sure. uh, that's one suggestion. Uh, partner Number with two, make it com. suck more than not be vaccinated. Yes. Right? Like that's Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer has linked her state reopening policies to progress in shots, letting restaurants and bars increase the occupancy when 60 percent of the state's been vaccinated and lift mask orders when it's 70 percent. Maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't. We don't know. Hmm. Well, that's because the person who's all against civil liberties, the attorney, this is why I'm laughing when I'm reading her. Yeah, right. If all or most countries instituted vaccine passports, that would change my mind. <laughs> OK, well, I hate they don't that you're forcing me, but if you force me, uh, OK, I'm all right with that. Because sure. it's all about several liberties, but, you know, hey. Yeah, until it's when it gets in my way. Until and... it's going to inconvenience me, in which case, okay, civil liberties, schmivel liberties, uh, you know, get me the vaccine so I, I can guess. go about my business. You know, and, and the third point he makes is the natural selfishness of people. Mm-hmm. What if natural that. immunity isn't enough to protect your grandmother? Yeah. Don't do it for you. Do it for your grandmother. I mean, sure. that, that is a, a key theme. You've got to get back to people's families. You're not just doing it for yourself. I need to remind you, civil liberties, yes, the West, we do things by ourselves. We don't need any. You're not doing it for just yourself. Yeah. You're doing it for your family. You're not doing it for the libs. You're doing it for your family, your family. Yeah. Do it for them. So those are the things that he thinks might work. But it's an interesting look at how folks think about this. And it's a reminder that not everybody looks at it the same, but the basic underlying difference is whether or not you thought the pandemic was serious. Part of that is watching Fox News, OAN, and all the garbage uh, media Mm -hmm. that plays the pandemic down as if 580-some thousand deaths don't count somehow. Uh, And the, the three people who started walking backwards when they got the vaccine is the big deal you know that's media yeah but for whatever reason if you don't think that the pandemic is a big deal then you're not going to think getting vaccinated against the pandemic is a big deal so that's really where it starts right and that's why it's important to explain no this is real and and this stuff matters as a starting point that's why you know you've tweeted forever about this is where we're at in terms of how many deaths and stuff like that Mm -hmm. that continues to be important Because people ignore it, forget it, or tune that stuff out, and they need to be reminded it's a big deal. And if it's a big deal, that makes the vaccine all the more salient. Because if it's not a big deal, everything else doesn't matter. I guess it's true. All right. 
Well, there's still a lot of people that need to hear that. Even people that you think are tuned into this stuff don't always realize exactly what's going on. I found mm-hmm. that out the other day. Is uh, Matt Iglesias uh, had it to dawn on him how many people had died. And doesn't everybody remember that time that Trump promised he was going to give everybody the miracle drugs that saved his life at Walter Reed? Oh, he must be reading your tweets. You've been tweeting about that forever. Yeah, well, he must not be because his tweet was, uh, how come nobody's I talking about this? this. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, all right. Whatever. And I think about 12 people said, uh, we are talking about it and pointed to the now months long, six, seven months long daily thread about it. But um, yes, but but I take yeah. you back to parachute yeah. journalism about the sound. Yeah, right. A small newspaper reported this three months ago, but now I'm here for the New York Times, followed by the headline, how this disaster I just learned about could have been avoided. <laughs> I mean, it's the same concept here. Yes, right. Exactly it. No problem. Like I'm We were shocked to it. discover this thing that everybody else already knew about. Right. So now it's in his Now it's important, so we'll write about it. Know. Know. Okay. But, but that, that's old. That's as old as uh, can, reporting, you know. Yeah. Right. The whole concept that uh, what's news is what happened to your editor on the way to work. He right. got in a car accident. He's in traffic. Oh, well, we got to write about this. It's important. Yeah. It just happened to my editor and he told me I have to write a story about it. That's the way of the world. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm accepting of it now. It's happened to me enough times and all right. of us enough times that I'm used to it. All right. And then the last thing here about the, the pandemic uh, political interface here is the fact that yesterday... The United States, with the World Trade Organization, WTO, hmm. yes, will back proposal to waive intellectual property rights and boost COVID-19 vaccine production uh-huh. after you know, getting a whole lot of grief. Remember, Biden does the right thing after you make him do it. Yes. He is the quintessential uh, uh, apocryphal FDR, who may yeah. or may not have said that. But, you know, well, you could make them say, I that. want to do it. I agree with you. Now make me do it. You know, give right. me some political pressure so I could say, look, you know, I'm just doing what the uh, constituents want here. Oh. So whether it's the, just have uh, questions. Uh, raising That's the all. cap on uh, the number of uh, migrants allowed in or whether it's uh, backing proposals to waive intellectual property rights. These are complex mm-hmm. things where a simple fix like this pleases people who want them to do it because there's no reason why to because it's an important first step. But like in both situations, it's not the total answer to the whole problem. So just uh, to remind people, uh, this is a story in uh, Stat News about right. backing the proposal. There's another one in the Washington Post. Biden commits to waiving vaccine patents, driving wedge with pharmaceutical companies. This, of course, has the extra added advantage of getting the pharmaceutical companies pissed off with him. So if you're going to be on the side of an argument that the public mm-hmm. would like you to be on, yeah. be against the pharmaceutical companies and for the public. That's always sure. good. It but, seems to work. Here's the reality. While the decision of the government to support an IP waiver, intellectual property, that is, IP, uh, uh, on COVID-19 vaccines is a step in the right direction, many other things now need to happen. This is from Julian Potet, who is a tropical disease advisor and uh, a vaccine advocate. advises the disease. For the waiver to effectively accelerate vaccine availability, significant dollars needed, as well as tech transfers. Tech transfers require both parties, originator vaccine companies and recipient vaccine companies, to collaborate and share know-how. It's like when you have two companies agreeing to make a, a, the other company's vaccine. Uh, yeah, that hasn't worked out all that well yet. No, but that's what they mean by tech transfers. Right. Okay. So you can see that happening in some cases Don't put within dirt the United and garbage States. garbage in it. That's the tech. If the originator vaccine company is reluctant to collaborate, the IP waiver alone will have limited impact. Okay. Now, tech transfer hubs can be efficient ways to catalyze tech transfers. WHO has established a tech transfer hub for mRNA vaccine technology. And importantly, the intellectual property waiver proposed by the U.S. government is restricted to COVID-19 vaccines. If it doesn't cover therapeutics, it's a shame. If there's one class of tools that could quickly benefit from an IP waiver, it's small molecule drugs. Uh-huh. As is, it's much easier to copy small molecule drugs and vaccines through reverse engineering, an IP waiver on COVID-19 drugs would quickly translate into accelerated availability of generics of patent-protected small molecule drugs. And there's a few on-patent expensive drugs approved, like remdesivir and many more in the pipeline. Yeah. And generics could be available in a few months if patents were removed. So the case of monoclonal antibodies and other large molecule biological drugs is somewhere in between because they're not easy to copy and mm. so you need the access to the cell lines that help you make them. 
So in sum, glad to see the U.S. support the IP waiver. Again, it's necessary but not sufficient, and more needs to happen, including investment and tech transfer. Other tools, uh, like the small molecule drugs being generic, should be covered by the waiver as well. So it's a first step. It doesn't solve all the problems, but it's a whole better look than looking like you're resistant to any of this stuff happening. Okay. Yes. And the fact that even the smallest step that doesn't change anything is fiercely uh, fought by the pharmaceutical companies yeah. tells you what you need to know about what side they're on. I guess so. What are these small molecule drugs? What's that about? I don't even know. Have we uh, into it? You know, know the, some of the, the, the large, well, uh, there are uh, potential cures. Yeah. But I mean, uh, are the ones we've heard of, I, you mentioned, I guess, that the remdesivir falls under large molecule. Is that right? And, yeah, there's, uh, there's others. Um, do we know any names? Uh, there's something called Illumiant. Okay. Okay. How it's a drug for the treatment of, of rheumatoid arthritis in adults whose disease was not well controlled using traditional medicines. It's an okay. inhibitor of various uh, kinases, and it's a relatively small so molecule here. drug okay. that would uh, uh, you know, be so sent are... around the world if it didn't have patent protection. And they're easier to And they're much copy. easier to make. Okay. Uh, I guess that's good. I don't. I haven't heard about the names of any of these things. I'm just curious. Well, in case there's they stuff turn in the pipeline. Up. There's stuff that's not uh, yet out. There's stuff mm -hmm. they're talking about. Drink the fish but the tank. whole point uh, is that uh, there's potential there. You know, okay. so you have to look at the broad category of not just uh, vaccines, but all, which are very difficult to make. Mm -hmm. uh, large scale antibodies, which are somewhat difficult to make, and small molecule treatments which are relatively small. easy to make. Okay. So, small. you know, do it for all of them, I guess. and you help the world. Uh, and that will Good. cost the pharmaceutical companies some money, so there'll be some resistance some. to it. We gave them an awful lot. So well, yeah, I mean, they're still less. making a lot. Okay. So what's the, I don't know. Uh, that's, that's interesting. Now, I, I see Julian Potet here, the, uh, the profile, Neglected Tropical Disease Advisor. Well, there are neglected tropical diseases. He's not neglected, but there are tropical <laughs> diseases that people just don't pay attention to. I was wondering, to. who's being neglected here? And uh, does this, like, you know, so tropical disease tell Peter me about Hotes, your childhood? Peter uh, Hotes falls in that category, too. Uh, he's a lot better known uh, as a uh, pro-vaccine person, also uh, uh, working on his own vaccine, the people's vaccine, which is a lot cheaper to make. Yes. Uh, but he's basically a tropical disease guy. But doesn't Infectious Martin Shkreli also fall in that category? Well, he's not a doctor. No, that's true. But he is a uh, neglected tropical disease profiteer, uh, uh, well. I think, right? He's the guy, I mean, his his whole shtick was uh, drugs that just, uh, drugs for diseases that aren't uh, profitable to launch new drugs. drugs are often done. Yeah, all right. Well, all right, uh, just so long as he doesn't turn into one of these guys, I guess. If he turns out to be a weirdo... Uh, maybe there's something wrong with this sector. Well, you know, but other people uh, who perhaps are better known and in a better position to uh, argue this uh, have, have made the same point. Okay. It's not enough to simply get rid of the patent. That doesn't solve all the problems. Yeah, all Any right. more than raising the migrant cap uh, solves all of the immigration issues. True. Okay, I can see that parallel. It's just, these are complicated situations where a lot more has to go into trying to fix things. But it's agreed that it's a good first step. Exactly. Okay. And there's no reason Excellent. to, and, and so not we'll agreeing it. to the first step is bad. All right. So agreeing to the first step is good. Then it gets complicated. All right. Well, that's why I guess we have these guys. Let's not neglect them. Yeah. I guess. We'll read that. Yeah. Well, you just didn't. Uh, you, good job. We did. Not we, you know, we mentioned guy. him several times. You, you mentioned his name all on your own. There you that's go. That's true. So you're no right. longer neglected. Your that's disease right. is your favorite yeah. disease, you know. But uh, there you go. All right. Well, I'm glad. And there's some mention of which of these things are the small molecule things it, because they're drugs that we haven't heard of. And I want to be able to separate them from, you know, what was it? The, the horse uh, deworming one that every once in a while that the nuts come up with and say you should take this you know, drug. bleach. Bleach is pretty small well, molecule. No. OK, true. But that one I recognize not not to eat it. Uh, but, yeah, some of the other weird things they they sound like drug names, although that could be anything these days. I just want to be sure, you know, or if someone told me, for instance, 
we're pushing this drug. And someone else said to me, well, it's from yeah, rheumatoid the whole arthritis. Question of which say, oh, no, this guy's a actually quack. work with uh, COVID yes. is a major question. I mean, the simplest oh, yeah. ones are still steroids, oh, which yes. are really cheap and, and available all over the world. But uh, what about if you're not that sick? What about if, you know, you're in a situation where you're still home? Are there things that you can use outpatient? Are there things you can use orally? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of open questions about what's best there. And so, you know, he's just trying to make the overall generic point. Don't just look at the vaccines. Also look at the treatments. Uh, You want a small molecule that really helps a lot, which when in short supply can be a disaster. Oxygen. Oh, well, yeah, that is kind of small. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's about as small as you get and it's about as important as you get. So don't neglect True. those other things. Hydrogen. And you're just Smaller. working. No, it doesn't work the way oxygen oh. does. Right. So, uh, and uh, it's, it's a little bit more. You blow the people up and then. So, you know, so, then, uh, you know just, just keep in mind that uh, it, it isn't just about the vaccines. And, and again, first step in a complex situation. So there's your summary as we Excellent. get close to the hour. Yeah. And uh, I'm done for the week and I'll be back on Monday. And uh, my new computer is coming on Monday. That's good. OK. We're It'll take me that. a couple of days to set up. But so yeah. far, this thing is lasting until then, which is good. I still get these error messages. I, I During the show, during the hour, I got three error messages about the hard oh. drive going to fail soon. All right. But they, they assure me it'll last a couple more weeks. So hopefully, uh, you know, by Monday, everything will be the beginnings of setting something else up. Yeah. Okay. I am. I'm hopeful for that. I'll um, use the old computer for Monday and excellent. maybe by Wednesday I'll be on the new one. We'll Does see. Does your chair need oiling or anything? I, or are you raising poultry in the house? I'm not certain what. A, a, a couple of creaks and groans there. That yeah, that's I, the chair. Okay. I mean, you know. Probably yeah, that's my back. If you're raising. Yeah, <laughs> my right. back needs oiling. What was that rheumatoid oh, arthritis yeah. drug you mentioned earlier? Oh, yeah. Okay, so we can clean all those things up, I think, over the weekend. Good luck. I hope the computer comes through. And uh, Yeah. Dorothy, get the oil can. We're going to do it. All right, we'll do that and uh, and send some snow your way as well. And if you rust, uh, let us know. Thanks, it's Greg. It's a really good microphone, I have to say. Yeah. All right, welcome back now to the k in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Okay, I think I... <laughs> Our microphones are too good. That's the problem. We bought these really nice microphones, and they pick up every sound there is to make. But okay, I'm I'm happy that uh, new computer on the way. Good luck to you, Greg, dealing with the new operating system. I know you're not maybe up to speed, and it takes a couple of days to find your way around these things. But we'll have a practice run if you like, and make sure that the uh, Skype works, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Although I fear every day that they're going to like phase Skype out somehow and find some way of making me have to pay for this thing. Although there is a brand new weird Twitter technology that they've rolled out. I ignored the last one that they rolled out, which was what do they call them? The um, ah, I forget. Uh, but the uh, the little things up at the top when you're at the home screen and people what, the the. Uh, I can't even remember. What are they? Are they video slash audio things that sort of disappear after time? Fleets. That's right. They called them fleets. And I didn't know why. And I just thought it really didn't matter. Uh, I've never used them. I think I viewed one from somebody once when they rolled out the new technology. And I said, I wonder what that looks like. And I saw it and I said, well, I won't be looking at those. That's not interesting to me, but there's a new thing that they're rolling out that I parked in pocket. And maybe, I don't know if any of you guys have experimented with it or understand the technology innately in some way, uh, spaces, uh, coming on Twitter here. And I, I took a look at this thing, the, their, their own article about it over on their help blog or what have you. Uh, So Twitter Spaces, uh, a new way to have live audio conversations on Twitter. We now, of course, have live written conversations on Twitter. Now you can have live audio conversations on Twitter. And maybe the fleets were sort of a a stepping stone to that where you could add audio and other people could then download it and listen to it. But now you can have live, I guess, two-way audio conversations on Twitter, which means it's kind of like a telephone 
or they've converted Twitter into Skype in some way. But this uh, this is the possibility I thought about for this thing. Uh, I'll read more a little bit about what they have to say. So now you can have live audio conversations on Twitter. We've been testing and building this in the open. They're not hiding it. With Twitter Spaces, that's their Twitter account for the new product, Twitter Spaces, and your feedback so we get it right. We love how it's shaping up, but there is much more to come, including new features and updates, so stay tuned. Uh, they're launching this thing. They're giving it to not quite everybody. I think they're actually giving it to people who have uh, sizable enough followings first, and I think I might even qualify for that. But So basically... You start one, you host a space, and as a host of the space, you can uh, begin talking, and then other people, when you're hosting a space, if they follow you, there's some notification given to them if they start up Twitter while you're doing this thing, and then you can click into it and listen along, and the host can then give and revoke permissions to the people listening in on the space to also talk and to contribute to the space in that in that way and so you can essentially host these conversations and you can like like they said you can give out um and then revoke the speaking privileges anyone can join as a listener but it's up to the host to decide who gets to speak. And there's a limitation, right? Uh, at the moment, it says up to 11 people, including the host. So the host and 10 other people can be given permission to speak. Now, I guess what I was thinking was if uh, if somehow Skype disappeared tomorrow or we didn't have, it wasn't working that day, the, the system crashed or whatever, you might be able to use this Twitter spaces to do something like that. I'd have, I'd, I'd host a, space and Greg could tune into it and then I could feed it you know I guess I just have my phone open nearby and feed it this my own well and it wouldn't go through my microphone but it was through my phone to him maybe it would echo though I wonder anyway and then he could answer and the the question would be how do I feed the audio out of spaces and onto the show. And I guess if I had it on my phone, I could just hold the phone speaker up. The audio quality would be terrible. Maybe we could run it on one of the computers or the main show computer and just pipe that out into the, uh, you know, into the sound mix using uh, audio hijack that I use here. I guess it's possible. But the, the bigger and more interesting thing I thought was, well, we could use it for calls, to the show. You know, if you're listening live and you wanted to make a comment and you were thinking, oh, well, I'll, I'll tweet and use the KI team hashtag. And I still include, or I still encourage you to do that. You could, uh, participate in the space and then request the ability to join the conversation as a speaker. And I could do that. And I could either, I could have, you know, I could have 10 people cluttering your head, through the radio show or just one at a time and just say, you know, like pushing buttons on a switchboard, uh, taking calls from different places. I could instead just click on different people in Twitter, provided I could pipe that audio out. We, it would be a free substitute for, for being able to take calls during the show, which will complicate things enormously, but, and maybe ruin everything. But, might be an interesting experiment. And now that I've said it, uh, it sounds like I have work cut out for myself. But I don't know uh, if that would be something. I don't know if it would work. I guess we could just try it and see if it works. We could experiment ahead of time off the air to try it and see if it works. But uh, And I don't know whether people would be interested in doing it. But I get the sense that maybe once in a while, yes, they would be. Uh, the other thing that actually reminds me, a good suggestion that another of our listening pals had come up with. Um, and he's contributed to the show in the form of his essays from time to time. But uh, Gil Aquino, who uh, suggested for us, he, he's the originator of the uh, much easier to say alternative to Latinx, right? 
which is just being roundly rejected just everywhere these days. But he's the one who had suggested that we use Latine instead. Much easier, much more elegant. Uh, but he also, well, he, he, he registered a, a mild complaint the other day, as uh, you're all entitled to do. And he's right about this one, saying, time for you to update and change the message you use during the, the breaks for encouraging people to contribute by uh, contribute segments to the show, either sending in articles or reading themselves, sending in audio for audio segments. And it's true. I think we're still using the original pitch for that. And, you know, it seemed like, well, it doesn't need updating the same way the contributions one did. But, uh, you know, he's just tired of hearing it. And I imagine you all are. And I, the problem sometimes is, uh, finding more quiet time in the house to plan and record these things is not always easy. I mean, it's one, it's enough that I think that I ask everybody to be quiet from, you know, relatively quiet from nine to 11 every morning. It's kind of a tough thing to do. And to ask for more time seems like an imposition. Plus also, it's just not a fun thing to uh, come up with the wording and then record it and then engineer it and uh, put the music in. And, you know, it's not hard. It's just not enjoyable for me. And so Gil was saying, well, you know, uh, maybe uh, I would uh, do that or I could write a script for it or I could even record it. And it was a good thought. And then I thought, you know, what would be even better uh, is if we had several people doing that. It would be interesting because we could continue to rotate and choose from different ones. Although then I'd, I'm kind of obsessive about these things and I'd, I'd have to like rotate them in an order so that I didn't play one more than the other. But you could probably forgive me if I accidentally screwed that up. But uh, that's actually a good idea, I think. I you know tried to keep the announcements to about a minute or so in, in length. And we could do it this way. And so you wouldn't have, let's say, we'll, you wouldn't worry about putting your own musical bed into it unless you had something that was signature that you absolutely had to have under your own voice and you could engineer that. But if you just recorded, actually, if you recorded your own pitch, either for donating uh, to support the show monetarily because you've done that or you feel guilty about not having done that or you've had such a great experience doing or, you know, all, if I had you know, a couple of different messages to choose from, from listeners saying, I chose to donate to the show and here's why. That, I think, could be a lot more persuasive than me saying, I don't know, donate to the show because reasons and, you know, we need money to operate and it's all a good pitch, but it's nothing compared to somebody saying, I'm a real person and I actually decided to do this and you should too. And here's what made me decide and maybe it'll move you. Or... I'm a real person and I have contributed by reading segments or sending articles or any of those things. Either one, I think, would be a lot more persuasive if it came from the audience. And so I thought it was a kind of a the the germ of a great idea there. And maybe we could make that work sometime if anybody wants to experiment with that. And uh, you can time it out and make sure that you keep it to under a minute or so and yeah see now i got you all right darwin is already in here although yeah send me a script and i'll donate my voice acting time then yeah, that would work but then i have to script it but i i could probably do it but also if there are others who are interested in scripting them themselves that's fine uh that's much you know it's a hell of a lot better and i don't have to, <laughs> to write the script but i could definitely help with those things I think it would be more effective. I think we'd probably grow the uh, donating audience and the number of contributions we get from other voices, both of which are great things, only one of which I can actually uh, trade for food. But but I think we get more donations, the more voices we include, too. So indirectly, um, I think it's a great idea and it's one worth experimenting with. And if you're interested and want to wing it, and send me a recording, and I guess if it's uh, outrageously horrible, <laughs> I'll tell you so, and we'll work on cleaning it up. If you want a script, I guess I could work up a couple of scripts too, or at least some basic talking points if you don't know exactly what to say, and you can uh, customize it from there. Sounds like work, but it may, it's so 
It sounds so much like work that it just might work, I guess. Okay, I just wanted to pitch that there. I thought that was a good idea for Gil, and uh, we'll see what we can come up with for Darwin. And, yeah, actually, for people who have contributed their voices to the show for a long time, now it makes sense. Now it's like a guest celebrity uh, pitch, right? Everyone will say, ah, even without identifying himself, I know who's making that pitch. That makes me feel connected and part of a community. Take all my money, that sort of thing. That's what we're looking for. Okay, moving on to the rest of the news uh, and other comments. Let's see what's going on here. Brian Monroe commenting on the wait and see vaccine citizens. Uh, they've waited and they've seen. Oh, okay, that's just us saying so. Yeah, right. True. They've waited. They've seen. It's true. That's exactly what's gone on. How has Canada been doing with the uptake of the vaccines we have loaned them? I am wondering. Uh, I think they're too polite to refuse once we send them up there, so I bet they're uh, 100% have made it into arms at this point. And they probably didn't even have to give them a donut in order to get them to do it. But if they did, I assume they would be the Tim Hortons donuts because I think that's law there. Okay, what else have we got? Rebecca Roman says, uh, where we've got this warning. This might be a fake tweet, but it still made me laugh. Uh, is this... Uh, okay, what is this? This is Hear Me Roar, or Stop Trump 20, <laughs> who has tweeted, Lauren Boebert, uh, a, a quote from Lauren Boebert, is that what may be fake? The quote, nothing is built in America these days. I just bought a TV and it said, built, <laughs> it said built in antenna. <laughs> okay, that's... That's pretty good. I don't even know where the hell that is. All right. I'm guessing that's a fake quote. True. But if anyone could accidentally make that mistake, Lauren Boebert, I think, chief among them. All right. Well, let's see. Um, yeah. Other uh, comments from today. Rebecca active so far. Yeah. She also thought the Arizona weirdos were shining the UV light to see if they've been folded. And I think we did get to that possibility. And also bringing us the news, the not surprising at all news, that uh, the slumlord Kushners cheated their tenants, according to the tweet from Christopher C. Alberto. Who's Christopher Alberto? Uh, Chris Alberto Law is the name he tweets under. Former federal prosecutor. Okay, so that gives us some idea here. Based in Boston says a judge finds that Kushner owned management company charged deceptive fees to thousands of tenants in a lawsuit filed after ProPublica found widespread problems in their apartments. Um, yes, I feel like we've heard this news. Well, I mean, you know, this is a new and specific example. I'm sure I'll, I'll lend, I'll loan you the tweet up there in Canada and you can read it and absorb it and uh, move forward as necessary. They've, uh, you know, long been suspected of being, uh, well, slumlords and deceptive people. And, uh, okay, this confirms that story. Uh, not enough discussion of what Kushner is up to in his re early retirement from government. I mean, in one sense, I'm glad we never hear anything more about him, but it probably just means he's stealing more money elsewhere, and we should check that out. Uh, other news from within our KITM listening community. We have news from a friend of the show and uh, frequent donor and listener David Paquette from Rhode Island, who tells us this news that, to, well, he emailed me yesterday to say that tomorrow evening, that's now tonight, or I guess this evening, an anti-gerrymandering bill that will be considered by the Rhode Island State Senate Judiciary Committee receives its hearing and that, well, David had a hand in actually authoring the bill and he's going to be testifying on behalf of the bill this evening. So I don't know, is there a Rhode Island C-SPAN or anything like it? I'm sure, well, I'm not sure, but maybe they even live stream the things. A lot of people do that these days. So you can... Check that out, maybe, later on today. I wonder if I could find out about whether they have a stream, and if so, include that in the roundup today. That would be exciting. I would like to just 
see how that goes. But good luck. And uh, I don't know. Do you have to say break a leg or good luck for testifying before a Senate Judiciary Committee for David? Uh, and he sent us a copy of the bill. And uh, so he got uh, the sponsorship of State Senator Roger Picard, Jean-Luc's brother, Roger, I guess, uh, to introduce the bill. And it's all official looking and everything. And you can read the whole thing. And it's got all kinds of fun technical language. And it's only three pages and not even full pages of that. So we can read this if you want to. This is very official looking. So, hmm. An act relating to General Assembly redistricting introduced by Senator Roger Picard just recently actually dropped and referred to the Judiciary Committee. And let's see. What do we got here? Sec, uh, section 1 reads that Chapter 22-1 of the General Laws entitled Composition of Senate is hereby amended by adding thereto the following section. Special voting requirements for Senate redistricting. So this is all the anti-gerrymandering uh, language. The passage of all acts which address the redistricting of the Senate shall satisfy special voting requirements. No amendments to Section 22-1-2 entitled districts or any Senate redistricting legislation may be adopted unless they are supported by a majority of the members present and voting, <laughs> good standard, in each of the two chambers and by a majority of members in each of the two largest member-represented political parties. Very flexible language. Uh, I mean, you know. It's complex sounding. I wonder if we would want to unravel that for us at some point. It's it's actually, I think, quite straightforward and, and simple. But uh, I guess the requirement here is that a, how does he put it? Uh, a majority of the members present and voting in each of the two chambers and by a majority of members in each of the two largest member represented political parties. So a bipartisanship requirement in order to adopt newly redrawn district lines. A majority of each of the members of the top two, and I assume it's still mostly Republicans and Democrats, even in Rhode Island, wild and crazy Rhode Island. But if a majority of the two parties don't accept it, so that's a pretty strong uh, roadblock, quite honestly. So I wonder, I have to think about how that, well, we'll see. How the hearing goes, congratulations to David for getting any bill on this subject this far. And certainly hope your testimony goes well. And maybe we can all even tune in and, and see it. I just, I like the story. You know, we're all, we all fancy ourselves activists here. And occasionally we have some extraordinary act of activism to feature from among our ranks. That's, that's really something. I mean, talk about going above and beyond. I called my congressman. And I told him, here's a bill. And I wrote it and sent it to him. Now, that's that's the way to get things done. So, all right. Thanks again for sharing that news with us, David. I hope I haven't embarrassed you here or, or uh, made you even more nervous by uh, hinting that uh, millions of us now might tune in via live stream, if that's available to us, to to watch you. Don't think about that. Well, you're testifying. I'm sure I'll get past it. All right. Let's see. Other bits and pieces of news that I can share with you. There's an awful lot. Um, let's see. One that we touched on yesterday that we now have a little bit more detail on, that Trump is not paying Giuliani's legal bills. And when it was mentioned yesterday, and even from this headline that I have today from Talking Points Memo, it's not quite clear exactly what they mean. By this, but in reading the body of the article, we uh, we get a better understanding of exactly what the problem is here. We knew, of course, that when the if the question is will Trump pay for whatever it is, the answer is no. So no surprise here. But uh, I thought when Greg mentioned it yesterday that Trump was being asked by Giuliani, please pay for the lawyers I need to hire to represent me now that I face criminal liability in in so many of these cases. But no, the answer is actually, or the, uh, the, the situation is actually, this is about 
Giuliani collecting on that $20,000 a day fee that he said he was charging Trump for representing him in the whole run up to the big lie and you know post election claims of fraud etc cetera, etc cetera. and you all remember i mean i think at the time we all knew trump wasn't going to pay that uh, and now he's still not paying it and he's apparently giuliani prevailing upon him somehow to please pay the bills trump was asked to pay up as giuliani faces growing legal bills so i guess what's happening here is he is himself accumulating costs for legal representation. And it's not so much that he's asking Trump to cover those costs directly as he is, as it is, he's asking him to please pay those invoices like he was serious for $20,000 a day. And then he would be able to use the money to cover his own legal bills. Well, neither of those things are going to happen. Zoe Richards writes this piece for TPM, former president Donald Trump in January apparently fresh out of ideas about how to overturn his election loss and days away from leaving the White House, had reportedly not appreciated a demand from his personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, for $20,000 a day in fees for his failed attempts to overturn the results of the 2020 presidential election. And, you know, a lot of people would probably complain about this, but Trump was guaranteed to complain about the idea. I'm not going to pay you if I lose. It's not the way it works, but that's how Trump would uh, view it. The Washington Post reported at the time that he told his aides, that is, Trump told his aides, not to pay, uh, which is what he said about his hair all the time, right? <laughs> not to pay. Uh, however, this, he means something different. It doesn't appear that his position has changed much since then or that he's opening his pockets to help his associate and former top enabler as Giuliani faces his own costly legal battles after FBI agents executed search warrants in his home and office last week. New reports suggest that allies of Trump's former lawyer have been pleading with the ex-president to pay Giuliani for failed efforts to overturn the results of the 2020 election. I wonder who's doing that. It's a losing proposition. Trump weakly came to Giuliani's defense during a Fox News interview last week after learning about the warrants, but talk is cheap, as the saying goes, and so is Trump, I guess. Andrew Giuliani told CNN his father was reimbursed for travel-related expenses incurred after the 2020 election when he departed on a false election fraud crusade to Arizona and other states. Giuliani has not, however, been paid for legal services, his son said. The legal costs with him fighting to retain his law license in New York and fighting the Southern District of New York on what I think are bogus charges, that should be indemnified, Andrew Giuliani said. Giuliani has hired new lawyers in the costly defense, and his own attorney, Robert Costello, has also raised the issue in recent days with lawyers for Trump, CNN said. That's not going to go over well. The development comes after Trump in January had reportedly instructed aides not to pay Giuliani's fees and had also demanded that he be consulted to personally approve any reimbursements for Giuliani's travel expenses while stunting in various battleground states to challenge election results. Trump had dumped the former New York City mayor as his attorney in February amid the frustration of his second impeachment. I don't even recall that that was the case. The New York Times reported that Giuliani advisors or Giuliani's advisors have been urging aides to the former president to reach into a $250 million war chest to pay Giuliani. During an interview with ABC News, Giuliani's son said that his father's fees should be covered by the Trump's campaign coffers. I mean, is there any point at which they'll get mad at Trump and actually split from him? I guess probably not. I think all those Americans that donated after November 3rd, they were donating for the Legal Defense Fund, the younger Giuliani said. And he's right there. Or, or you know, I mean, I don't know that maybe people really didn't believe that they were donating to a Legal Defense Fund, but that was the pitch. I mean, being right won't change Trump's mind. He's got control of the money. He's not giving it up. But uh, yeah, get mad. Why not? I think all those Americans that donated after November 3rd, they were donating for the Legal Defense Fund, the younger Giuliani said, although they may also have been thinking they were 
donating to Trump's legal defense fund. And I guess Giuliani thinks he provided legal defense, but I guess, yeah, I, I don't know why he thinks that's the case. Anyway, uh, I think he says it's very easy to make a strong case. It's very difficult for him to make a strong case for anything. For the fact that he and all the lawyers that worked on there should be indemnified, which is, of course, not the same thing as paying them for their services, but Andrew Giuliani probably doesn't know that. Whoops, I accidentally turned the music up a little too high, way too high. But that just reminds me of the importance of cutting out and uh, letting you know that we'll be back in two minutes. So now that's done. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. All right, welcome back now to the Cape Row in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. All right, uh, many, many more things to share with you. Uh, and the fact that we aren't going to get through them all, uh, you can never let that bother you. And we're going to need fodder for tomorrow's show, of course. So, uh, some random choices about uh, the various things that I need to update you on. Let's uh, jump over to BuzzFeed News for just a moment. BuzzFeed and... Uh, in Talking Points Memo, figuring highly in today's pocket. But here's one that had escaped my notice to date, but might be of some interest to all of you who followed all the things, the developments throughout the so-called Trump administration. Ukraine's former prosecutor general. You know, there's like about 50 of these guys, former prosecutor generals in Ukraine. And, and you know, the controversies that surrounded them. Uh, you may recall, of course, that uh, Trump and his cadres cadre uh, attempted to smear joe biden uh, prior to and during and after the campaign by claiming that he exerted enormous pressure in ukraine by virtue of his position as vice president and the person in charge of ukraine policy ostensibly under the obama administration to fire one of the now former prosecutors prosecutors general in Ukraine, uh, so that, as the allegation went, he would not look into uh, Hunter Biden's activities in Ukraine. And it turned out, no, that wasn't really what was going on. So, okay, they imagined something going on that was terrible and they felt uh, entitled to complain about, but it wasn't really happening. But then they were very mad that they couldn't get anybody else to say that it did happen. And uh, like everything else, it was projection or a prediction of something that they would be caught doing later on. Ukraine's other former prosecutor general now says that he was fired. Why was he fired? He was fired for not opening the Biden probe that Trump wanted. So what do you know? Lock him up. Right. Uh, I guess that's the only possible answer. The transcript of a call between Rudy Giuliani and the Ukrainian president's top aide published last week by BuzzFeed News. And it's still sitting in pocket um, undigested for the show. I would looked at it and it was it was pretty raw. And I thought, well, we could act out the transcript, but I don't know if there's anything good in it. So now we've given BuzzFeed a chance to digest it for us. And here's what they came up with. The transcript of that call shed new light on the sacking of, ready for this one, another, you know, a, a Ukrainian name here, Ruslan, that's his first name, R-O-U-S-L-A-N, Ruslan, hmm, how will we approach this one, Ryaboshapka, 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 <laughs> no idea, R-I-A-B-O-S-H, Ryabosh. 
APKA, Shapka, Ryabo Shapka. That's my best attempt at it. I don't know where the emphasis lies. And I even tried during the break to look up, is there a pronunciation for it? And unfortunately, I landed on one of those how to pronounce things that has like a computer voice that says it. I mean, you tell me if this is any help to you. Ruslan Riyabashapka. Riyabashapka. They put more syllables in there than I think are actually in there. Ruslan, fine. Ruslan Riyabashapka. Riyabashapka. No help whatsoever. So hearing a computer do it is unhelpful. And, uh, well, look, that's not the story, okay? But I'm going to have to read his name a couple of times. Uh, and then I thought I would look on YouTube to see if maybe he was interviewed anywhere and he said his name or he had coached someone else on how to say his name. But uh, that could take forever to find and we don't have that time. So Ryaboshapka. Ryaboshapka is my best attempt, but it's so long that I think I worry about my ability to pronounce it during the reading of this article. Christopher Miller, who just has to write it because he's a reporter for BuzzFeed News, uh, has set us up by putting this guy's name all over this article, I think. And we'll see how we get out of here. Ukraine's former top prosecutor, and I guess his most immediate former top prosecutor, because I feel like there's a thousand of them says he believes he was fired in March. He believes, he believes, we don't know. He was fired in March 2020. That much he knows was actually true. Over his refusal to open the Hunter Biden investigation that Rudy Giuliani and former President Donald Trump asked for, and which Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky's top aide had promised to see opened. This is some time ago now, March 2020. Maybe we didn't notice because we were busy locking down. Ruslan, that guy, Ryaboshkapa, told BuzzFeed News in an interview from where? Strasbourg, France. Why? Don't know. On Wednesday. Why Wednesday? There's no telling. That the transcript of the July 22nd, 2019 phone call between Giuliani and Andre Yermak, published last week in BuzzFeed News, is evidence that he was ousted for political reasons. It reveals an important detail, Ria Boschkapa said of the transcript. Yermak promised Giuliani to open an investigation into Hunter Biden, the son of President Joe Biden. I didn't know about the essence of the call. I didn't know Yermak promised to help Giuliani. Details of the Giuliani-Yermak call were first reported by Time in February. BuzzFeed News published the detailed transcript for the first time. The call was followed three days later by the infamous one held between Trump and Zelensky that would lead to the U.S. president's first impeachment in the House of Representatives and subsequent acquittal in the Senate. Just let these investigations go forward, Giuliani pressed Yermak, according to the transcript. Let's get someone to investigate this. We'll be ready to coordinate, to work, and investigate everything which you listed, Yermak responded. Later in the call, he reiterates his position, saying everything Giuliani is asking for will be, quote, deeply investigated. (laughs) Using their own trick. Very strongly, within two weeks, a very short period of time, it will be deeply, strongly investigated. Ria Bashkopa is the second official to say their firing was influenced by Giuliani's back-channel Ukraine campaign. In April 2019, Marie Yovanovitch, then the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, was recalled. She testified during Trump's first impeachment hearing that Giuliani and several Ukrainian political operatives, most of whom would later be sanctioned by the U.S. for their roles in helping to smear the Bidens, were behind the effort to get her fired. Her firing, according to reporting by the New York Times, is now a central component in federal authorities' investigation into Giuliani, whose New York City apartment and office were searched last week. FBI agents seized electronic devices, which they are now scouring for information related to Giuliani's business activities in Ukraine, and ties to its powerful oligarchs, as well as Yovanovitch's firing. Giuliani has denied any wrongdoing, In response to questions from BuzzFeed News, Zelensky's office said 
that neither the Ukrainian president nor Yermak exerts pressure on law enforcement agencies. Mr. Ryabashkopas, Ria oh boy, statements may be caused by internal political circumstances in Ukraine and have nothing to do with the foreign policy of the state. Read the statement from Zelensky's office. The office of the president is interested in developing a strong system of independent law enforcement agencies in Ukraine. Ryabashkopa says that his team at the Ukrainian prosecutor's office conducted an audit of all the cases it inherited, including those related to the scandal-plagued Ukrainian gas company Burisma, where Hunter Biden worked. He said prosecutors found no wrongdoing on the part of the president's son. Zelensky asked me several times if there are violations of the law in this case, started by former Prosecutor General Yuri Luchenko, violations by Hunter Biden, Ryabashkova said. We looked at 15 or 16 cases. We reviewed all of them and didn't find anything that could be a violation of the law. Despite that result, he said, following the July 2019 call with Giuliani, Yermak continued to push him for months to open cases that involved the Bidens. Ryabashkova said he believes that pressure and Yermak's vow to Giuliani during the phone call brought to light in the transcript shows it was one of the reasons Zelensky decided to change the prosecutor general. Hmm, maybe, maybe not. Critics at the time were concerned by Ryabashkova's firing, a strong anti-corruption campaigner, he was seen by many as an independent-minded reformist. He was replaced in March 2020 by Irina oh boy, Veneditkova, a close Zelensky ally and lawyer who had worked on his campaign, raising doubts that she would perform her job independent of the president. He wanted someone more loyal to him who would say yes to his demands, Ryabashkova said although I don't recall that any investigation was ever opened, so I don't know. Shortly after, uh, this again, uh, Vened Venedict Venediktova, shortly after Venediktova took over at the prosecutor's office, she approved, oh, did she? A criminal investigation into former Ukrainian president, ah, uh, okay, this is, uh, she approved a criminal investigation into former Ukrainian president Petro Poroshenko for high treason and abuse of office. You want to check out our former guy? You're welcome to do it. Based on taped calls between the ex-leader and Biden when he was vice president in 2015 and 2016. Uh oh The recordings were provided to Veneditkova by Ukrainian lawmaker Andrei Durkash, a Giuliani associate whom the U.S. has since sanctioned for election interference and deemed to be a Russian agent. Zelensky also publicly encouraged the investigation. And I guess there's room for saying, OK, well, we'll get to the bottom of it or whatever. Biden's campaign and Poroshenko's office claimed the recordings were fake. Nevertheless, American right wing media presented the tapes as well as the investigation opened by Veneditkova as being related to the probes Trump and Giuliani were after. Veneditkova couldn't be reached for comment. While several investigations focused on Poroshenko and the calls remain open, Veneditkova, Veneditkova sorry, told Reuters in January that all probes into Burisma have been closed and there are no plans to reopen them. Everything that prosecutors could do, they have done, she said. Ryabashkova believes the investigations were closed because Biden defeated Trump and Ukraine wants to strengthen its relationship with the U.S. after a tumultuous few years. Yermak had good connections with the Trump administration, and he thought Trump would win the election. He promised he would deal with problems between the U.S. and Ukraine. He said, now he must fix the relationship between them. All right, although I'm not sure what to make of any of this. Uh, and and uh, it's not clear... If there's, I mean, I guess it's probably best if there are not on either side, one way or the other. But, uh, man, I don't know. It's a little weird, and I'm, I'm just putting it out there. I can't straighten it out for you at the moment. But, uh, one, I thought it was probably important to sift through that transcript, and I'm glad they did it for us and found something interesting. And two, just wanted to put this on the radar because who knows? Uh, something that's, if there's any level of complexity to it, it will likely be exploited by the Q weirdos and turn into something it's not, 
by next week, although they might be distracted by the other things that they're up to at the moment. And there's plenty of them. There's another BuzzFeed News digest uh, item that, again, I was waiting for somebody else to pick up and and digest these things for us. Even though we should be diving into primary sources ourselves, it just, I don't know if it makes for great radio. So also from BuzzFeed News, this time from Jason Leopold and Anthony Cormier, who write about the Mueller memos. Flynn, Bannon, Manafort, Ivanka, private emails from inside the Mueller investigation. Very interesting, and love to see what they digest from this. We actually sat at dinner together. Flynn, this is a pull quote from it, said of his meal with Vladimir Putin, which, well, yeah, we all saw that, and I'm not certain why you think that's a good thing. Uh, Let me see what's up here, and we'll see if we can squeeze this read in before closing out for the day. Five days before Donald Trump was sworn in as president on January 2017, his former campaign manager, Paul Manafort, sent an email to the person Trump had chosen as Deputy National Security Advisor. I have some important information I want to share that I picked up on my travels over the last month, Manafort wrote to K.T. McFarland. Manafort's ties to foreign leaders had already attracted the scrutiny of the FBI, and McFarland wasn't sure if she should take him up on his offer. She was already afraid, right? It's amazing how what bad news he was known to be. So... She sent an email to her boss, Michael Flynn. Well, that's a mistake. Uh, Give, and that's an error noted with a sick here, but I guess he means given. Given all that is going on, should I meet with him? McFarland asked. I would not meet with him until we're in the hot seats. Flynn wrote, unknown who he is working for and perception would not be good, especially now. This is Michael Flynn himself, a notorious spy. Warning KT McFarland that Paul Manafort is too hot to handle, too nuclear and too conflicted to even sit down and talk to. That's amazing. These emails are part of a cache of nearly 300 pages of documents from former special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation into the Trump campaign that were turned over Monday to BuzzFeed News and CNN in response to a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit. The records emails, text messages, and memos seized from subjects and witnesses contain previously undisclosed details about the Trump campaign's discussions involving Russia. And I think probably reading through this will only make you say, God, how timid was Robert Mueller? What a failure. The records released Monday also show that Jared Kushner, Ivanka Trump, and Donald Trump Jr. were deeply involved in the early stages of the campaign. I think we knew that. Ivanka told the co-chair of the campaign that Donald Jr. could recommend military advisors. Why? Because he's Donald Trump Jr. And Kushner discussed his secret meeting with Henry Kissinger. Should have blown that one up. And in a document titled National Security Memo 4, (laughs) Sebastian Gorka, a future advisor to the president, warned the campaign that Russia was, quote, a... This is interesting. I mean, Gorka's not wrong. A criminal enterprise and that Putin would only respond to a determined show of force. I guess that's why Gorka never actually got anywhere inside the administration. But what a self-aggrandizing jerk ass, too. This is a campaign memo, but he's entitling it National Security Memo 4, like numbering it like it's an official document. That guy is, his whole life is about cosplay. But he's not wrong about Russia, which is amazing. Some of the documents were redacted by the Justice Department and the FBI for reasons of national security, privacy, and ongoing law enforcement investigations. The records show Flynn soliciting Trump's strategist Steve Bannon in September 2015, before Bannon actually joined the campaign officially. Steve, Flynn wrote, just reaching back out, Let me know if Mr. Trump needs help with national security, intel, and intel community issues or foreign policy, because I'm a spy and I'll be his first controversy if you hire me, as the unspoken part. That December, he wrote to Corey Lewandowski, Trump's campaign manager. I wanted to send you this this past week, but had forgotten. Flynn shared a link 
to an article from Russia's state-run Sputnik News that quoted Flynn saying the U.S. must work with Russia and Arab countries to defeat the ISIS. Look out for the ISIS, everybody. Um, yeah, I mean, so he's campaigning for the National Security Advisor job, but doing it with Sputnik articles, which is kind of like that guy can't be National Security Advisor. He's, you know, well, one, reading Sputnik, and two, talking to Sputnik. Two things the National Security Advisor ought not to do. This is FYI, but something that Mr. Trump should at least be aware of. I have been very outspoken on this issue. At this point in the conflict, we, our current administration, has run out of good options. Also, I met with President Putin last Thursday in Moscow. We actually sat at dinner together. Flynn ended the email by saying, Merry Christmas! And thank God he could say that again, right? Thanks only to Trump. The records also include the text messages surrounding Flynn's December 2016 communications with Russia's former ambassador to the U.S., Sergei Kislyak, and Flynn's efforts to contain the fallout. That's, of course, what he eventually went down for, but then was pardoned. A month into his job as National Security Advisor, Trump fired Flynn for lying to Vice President Mike Pence, who he wanted to hang, about those communications. Flynn later pleaded guilty to lying to FBI agents about it. Then he said he didn't lie and tried to unplead it, and then he got pardoned even though he was sentenced to prison. On January, or sorry, December 29th, 2016, as the Obama administration announced sanctions against Russia in response to its meddling during the campaign, Flynn received a text message from an unknown individual. It was a link to a New York Times story, U.S. punishes Russia for election hacking, ejecting operatives. Flynn wrote back, time for a call? Three question marks. The unidentified person wrote, yes, KT on with Bossert, an apparent reference to Tom Bossert, Trump's Homeland Security Advisor. Flynn wrote back, okay, tit for tat with Russia, not good. Russian Ambo, A-M-B-O, Ambo, reaching out to me today. The documents reveal the array of individuals who sought out Flynn for his influence with the campaign. A vendor promised to knock off $100,000 from the price of a data program that would conduct, quote, influence operations. That doesn't sound good. Someone else wanted to share a declassified FBI document that involved a contract to investigate the servers. The document did not specify which servers. Flynn wrote, get me a number. Even WikiLeaks tried to connect with Flynn in June 2016. Great national security advisor. Fantastic. June 2016, a month before WikiLeaks released the first tranche or tranche of emails that had been hacked from the DNC, the organization reached out to see if he would be a guest speaker on the live stream of Julian Assange, the organization's founder. Assange was discussing Brexit and hoped the conversation would serve as counter-programming to some of the usual news discussion shows, a wiki leader producer wrote, Assange had seen Flynn on another TV appearance and was very interested in his perspective from the U.S. Flynn's camp quickly declined, with one unidentified associate writing to another, do we really want the general associated with this gentleman? That's why the Trump campaign became Moss Eisley on Earth, of course. No one wanted to associate with anyone else in that campaign because they were all filthy rotten liars and traitors let's just throw that one in there too uh but i guess not julian assange because he's not an american in may 2016 barbara ladeen whose husband michael wrote a book with flynn and was in frequent contact with him during the campaign reached out to a contact about what she said was a big story after mentioning her connection to flynn and newt gingrich Ladeen said she and a colleague wanted to brief the person on material we have found on the deep and dark web regarding stories you have been pursuing. Barbara Ladeen, of course, first class kook, but uh, often associated with um, a few other. There's the three Barbers, right? It was Barbara Ladeen, Barbara Olson, Ted Olson's wife, and Barbara Comstock, the former congresswoman for my area in Virginia who was portrayed as such a, a moderate and, and, and Barbara, well, Barbara Olson to an extent, I guess what passes for a moderate now. Same thing with Comstock, of course. They were both radical Republican operatives, but 
They love to pass themselves off as moderate thinkers, but a little too close to somebody who really made no effort to moderate at all and, and went full Trumper, Barbara Ledeen. So anyway, the nature of that material that she was talking about isn't disclosed in the email, but Ledeen said she hoped to speak with the person before the information was locked up because of its sensitivity. Very dramatic, right? According to the special counsel's report, Ledeen had been seeking emails that were purportedly hacked from Hillary Clinton's server. In September, Ledeen claimed to have found a batch of them, but an advisor determined they were not authentic, according to the special counsel's report. It's interesting, too. Like, did the incurious Ladine not ask, well, if they're not authentic, where did they come from? Because the answer is Russia, planting them so that you would, you know, make this mistake and embarrass yourself, or if you were never found out, at least embarrass Hillary Clinton. But, duh, you went ahead with it anyway. The new documents also contain emails sent by political operative Roger Stone. How curious. In 2015 and 16, advising Trump on a wide range of policy initiatives. In an email he sent on August 18th, 2016 to Bannon under the subject line, congratulations, Stone wrote, Trump can still win, but time is running out. You know, you need to pay me. I'm the only one who can save you. Early voting begins in six weeks. I do know how to win this, but it ain't pretty. Campaign has never been good at playing the new media. Lots to do. Let me know when you, just you, can talk. Bannon responded, let's talk ASAP. And then an embedded uh, scribd document of all these things. Uh, so, yeah, then I guess you're supposed to comb through them for yourselves. And I imagine that in the coming days, there'll be more revelations as uh, uh, Jason and uh, who was with him on this one, Anthony, distills some more things out of these memos. There's an awful lot to it. And of course, Empty Wheel is on the case and she's distilled a number of fun and interesting things out of these memos. I'm just curious to see where they lead. But uh, more importantly, I wanted to make you aware of the fact that they existed and people are looking to sort them out and uh, could be some interesting things to come in the near future. All right. Let's see. Other things worth mentioning? Well, let's just throw this mention in here because it's short. I think we can keep it relatively short. Uh, our good friend and fellow listener, Audible Video on Twitter, Kurt, sent me this note uh, from Norm Ornstein, who was tweeting that today, that was back on May 4th, I joined over 350 other scholars in sending a letter to the Senate encouraging filibuster reform. At stake, a quote from the letter, at stake is not only a functional Congress, but public faith in our system of government. And then he links to the full letter, which you can read here. Uh, Kurt very kindly said to me, uh, hey, K Grow X, that's, that's me, of course. I hope you are on this letter. And unfortunately, well, hmm, nothing really terribly unfortunate about it. But no, the answer is I am not on that letter, uh, and uh, as I explained to Kurt, uh, the people on that letter are serious scholars. They're tenured professors on some of our great universities and some of our crappy universities across the country, and I am not, and they do not consider me a scholar on this subject or any other, and I think that eh, might even be fair. Um, they've never heard of me <laughs> for the most part, and if someone told them who I was, they would just say, I don't belong on such a letter. And I couldn't possibly belong on such a letter because I couldn't possibly know what I'm talking about because my work on the subject was written for Daily Coast. And that is a hotbed, a well-known hotbed of nuts who don't know what they're talking about. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Well, you could be a little further from the truth, but that's pretty far. But that's pretty much where they are. And uh, it occurred to me, some of the names on the letter are people that I actually did do some work with on filibuster reform, not a whole lot of them, because they weren't doing anything on filibuster reform, them, but whatever. Um, but no, I mean, they weren't hiding it from me or anything like that or excluding me from the letter. I'm sure the letter was drafted by some professors and then shared among other tenured and untenured, I guess, professors around the country, probably through some email list serve. I'm not on it. I'm not a professor. And I guess if I had found out about the letter and said, I want to sign it, uh, well, they may have said, what the hell do we care? Go ahead and sign it. But more likely, they would have said, you are a professor where? And I would have said, nowhere. And they would have said, then you can't possibly know what you're talking about because only professors 
can really know the lowdown on all of this. Ten years after you started giving everybody a lowdown on it, but okay. Anyway, I'm glad the letter's been written. Norm Ornstein is on it. He'd, he'd know who I was, I guess. He's one of the few uh, who uh, is on the letter and who I actually have spoken to in the past. But anyway, it doesn't matter. The point is the letter is out there. One more stake, I hope, in the heart of the filibuster. We got another show, of course, tomorrow that we can fill up with all of these other stories. I'll put them on your radar before the weekend, and hopefully they'll seem like you got the news before the newspaper arrived on your front step with the big write-up that you'll be reading over the weekend. That's the magic of the show. Time now, though, to hand things over to Justice Putnam for the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. We'll see what he's got on tap. Uh, let's see. Ah, how about this? A warning to Bill Barr. If you haven't already, you should immediately retain legal counsel. I've got an idea for you. Rudy Giuliani goes cheap. He says he charges $20,000 a day, but you don't From have to pay. EdwardsRadio.com You have been listening to Kegro in the morning with well, Governor DeSantis is in the news for hiding everything this morning. We've got that. Plus, uh, of course, holding Alcee Hastings, the late Alcee Hastings seat unfilled until now January of 2022. So that, among many reasons why he should be repudiated and chucked out of politics forever. Next.